Hey there. Good morning. Uh, I'm Eric Schwimmer, um, and as the nice little presentation title suggests, I'm with Bloomberg. And the presentation we're going to go through today is Bloomberg's multi-provider video strategy and how we got here and all the nice little things we learned along the way and continue to learn. Um, in an ideal world, I get done a little bit early and give you guys some time for questions. So let's see if I can hop through this um, and get to the part that you'll probably learn the most, which will be right at the end when you get to ask whatever you want. We'll see how much I can answer. All right, so here's the agenda. Um, so we're going to talk about, um, <clears throat> wow, this thing didn't format too well, cool. Um, what our rationale is, what our learnings were, and what we still have left to do. So what's our rationale? Why did we go about this? Um, so our goal in Blueberg is to try to provide our video content to anyone we can and give that give the best experience we can in doing so. One of the things that we had one advantage that maybe some of the other content providers in the room do not is that we were late to the game in the TV space and being late in this particular case actually had some advantages um, in that when we went to negotiate our uh, carriage agreements with the MSOs, we made sure we retained our digital rights. Um, so as a result, we're pretty much free to distribute our content anywhere we want, when we want, without worrying about other agreements that are in place. Um, and so that allowed us to go out very early in the space and um, make sure that we get our content spread around, um, almost to the point where our digital um, footprint is, at this point, very close to what our uh, linear footprint is, and that's a good thing. Um, and so the other thing, not only do we want to get a better experience, not only for our streaming content, but also for our web, um, no matter what provider um, you have, if it's a single provider, at any given point in time, there's something going on in their networks. It's just the world's too big of a place. Um, and by being tied to a single provider, and even though those guys are amalgamating different carriers, you're still going to have quality of service issues. Um, that was another thing that motivated us. And then the third thing is, well, the obvious, right? Um, when you're able to use more than one, you're able to get cost savings, um, which helps you on many different scales. So what did our world look like? Um, so I'm going to talk about our non-video world, as, and, but mostly focus on our video world, because quite frankly, that's where most of our consumption is. Um, so in a non-video world, um, we were in a single provider situation. We were also using a uh, OVP to get started, which tied us into a lot of different choices. Um, and as a result, everything was black boxed. Um, and the other thing that it did um, is because our price points uh, for these services were so high, it almost negated the one advantage I just told you we had, which was no, um, nothing that uh, held us back from distributing our content. Um, because of our carriage rights, but because at the time the cost per unit was so high, we were making decisions that if you look at um, this space, the streaming space, as a nine inning ball game, we were maybe in inning number one or two and we were sitting there putting our relief pitcher in, so to speak. Um, so bad business choices, um, which is what I refer to, limiting the amount of consumption rather than going out and um, trying to get on as many devices as we could. So that's the world that we look like um, when we started. Um, in video, um, as I spoke about, we started with um, an outsource OVP. There's a lot of advantages. I'm not here to trash anybody. Um, um, when we had a, an OVP in place, it allowed us to get to market quickly, start to learn, um, and that's exactly what we did. Um, and, but what it did do is that we were tied to that platform and the, what I like to call the least common denominator factor, which was, you know, they're in business to satisfy many folks and whatever the masses wanted, which is where their platforms went. So we immediately saw a need to break free from that. And the other thing that where we were was we had many different uh, protocols when we started off this journey. RTMP, HDS, HLS, et cetera. Um, our quality was marginal because of some of these factors. And we were unable to respond to quickly to changes in the market. Say if a new video format, a uh, new video ad format came out, um, implementation of the different VAST standards, et cetera, those were limited. Um, and the other thing, as I spoke about earlier, was the 
um, ability to fail over in the event of any outages in carrier networks. Um, and of course, the pricing piece. Um, so, a lot of challenges you gotta overcome to make this strategy work. And I'm gonna sit here and tell you, this is what we want, what everybody wants to do, but in some cases for your business, it may not be the right choice, depending on the engineering talent and um, resources that you have, because it's not easy. I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you. This took us three years to get to the point of where we are today. And it's because we had to un really decouple a lot of different systems um, to allow it to occur. But the old way when we would do load balancing, the best case is maybe we did percentage based using a DNS provider if we wanted to, but you know, there's some inherent flaws on that, especially when it comes to quickly responding or you gotta keep your TTLs pretty low. Um, or you just did purely uh, percentage based on certain provider commits, but that takes no account into what's going on in the network and what the end user experience is like. Um, and that changes quite a bit. Um, and so also, what about proprietary solutions you might have in your, um, in your, um, in your infrastructure? You gotta think about that, especially as you bring on third-party products, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the other challenges that we didn't even know about when we started this journey, but came up along the way is, well, we needed to go to HTTPS for a lot of reasons, a lot of good reasons, um, from a standpoint of really assuring your users that they're getting the content they're asking for, um, not to mention industry trends, and just overall uh, a sense of um, where the, the, the direction of the whole content provider space is going. And the other one that got thrown in along the way was a uh, conversion from uh, Flash to HTML5. Um, so we had to deal with all these things as we were making that journey. Um, the first step in our journey was really, you know, when, we, when we're doing it for web pages, you know, it's like anything else. If you try to do this all at once, unless you're just starting up, um, it's gonna be a failure. Uh, so you gotta do this in stages and start to decouple. Um, when we did it on the web, our web pages, what we went after was first large objects, then we went after smaller ones, then we looked at disaster recovery, page level, and smart redirect services. Um, as I mentioned earlier, sort of alluded to earlier, there's some, some gotchas along the way. Um, third party uh, solutions. So especially in the content space, um, especially uh, when you happen to have a brand name like Bloomberg, we don't particularly like our content getting taken around and distributed without our permission for free. So if you want to integrate in a crawl blocker, there's a lot of different solutions on the market. Some of them even involve um, proxying your uh, C name over to somebody else. You got to think about that um, and those types of solutions and how they were going to fit into your overall strategy. Um, also with the rise of ad blockers, Another hot thing, there's a bunch of solutions out there to help you block that. If you go down the route with some of these guys, it will limit you architecturally. So you gotta watch out for those types of things. Add fraud, same thing. You get the point, right? Um, test and target solutions that allow you to do quickly test and targeting. So you're committing yourself on a lot of these different uh, individual point solutions that sometimes aren't even made in the engineering team. You've gotta work with your business partners. Um, to make sure you're aware of those things. You gotta understand how they're gonna affect, not only solve the immediate problem, but what they're gonna do to limit you in the future. Um, and as well as the other thing to think about is how do you do redirects? How do you do context URL switching? How are you gonna handle all those things? Um, if you use some solutions, they may limit your architectural to choices. So you gotta think about all those things as you go down this route. Um, so, video, the disclaimer. Um, besides, uh, you know, as I said earlier, I guess the big thing is why we have it easier than most of you. I don't have to worry about um, rights management um, because we have free and open rights to redistribute on any digital platform for all our content. I don't have to do, deal with DRM. Some of you guys in the audience probably do. And those DRM solutions, I'm sure, I haven't had to go down this route, but I'm sure they present some challenges in how you deal with multi-provider networks as well. Um, but the first thing we needed to do was abstract our video content um, into a metadata repository instead of having it into a single repository without having an open service to it. So essentially we created a, a, a microservice, nice little buzzword everybody likes to use, but it's a service that allows you to do a lookup of a, of a URL and then determine where that content is actually stored and then return where that asset is available on what networks. 
So we cr created a multimedia um, asset service. It's real, it's, it sounds hard, but it's actually a fairly straightforward key value pair database when it comes right down to. But that was the, that's the key to everything that makes everything work and allows us to quickly um, use other providers. Um, we introduced, we insourced our own uh, video player. Um, and that's not exactly peaches and cream either. There's some challenges that you have to deal with with that. We're using an open source framework when we did it. We didn't just completely build our own, um, though we tried that route once upon a time. Um, and so there's some advantages with it, um, as you can see up there on the, on the uh, slide. But there's some disadvantages, uh, not the least of which is there's a huge startup cost to time to actually get it implemented, integrate in with a lot of the uh, third parties that you have to, say ad servers, uh, quality of service metrics that you need to go, and uh, also analytics providers. Some of this stuff, especially in open source platforms, there's others you can learn from. Others you kind of have to figure it out on your own. Um, we also use this as an opportunity though to get to a single standard. For us, HLS made the most sense. I know for others it may not, but it's keep, it allows a level of ubiquity to keep things simple. Um, and we also went to a push publish pool model um, for how we publish our video. Um, and I'll explain that in a second or two. Um, so lots of things to consider um, as you go down this route. But you know, I'm fortunate that I get to work with a lot of talented engineers, um, both on our um, software development side and as well as our broadcast engineering side. So for us, this made a lot of sense. and It was something that we could achieve. Again, as you consider this journey, it's something you want to think about. Um, so at a high level, how does it all work? So live. Um, first, we start off with um, the actual consumer of the live product. Um, and so that person then is directed via a bunch of technology that we use, or actually third party technology that we use, to what's the most appropriate route. Um, that route is then chosen, but chooses between one of X number of CDNs. Um, those CDNs pull um, from right now from our cloud based live um, files. So live is just another way of saying really fast um, VOD when it really comes down to it. Um, you know, it's all video files at the end of the day. Um, so right now we're in multi regions within a single cloud provider. That won't be the way we end this story. Um, but it's the way we are at the moment. Um, but, you know, I think you guys probably saw a few months back when there was some outages with a certain vendor, why it's important to be multi-regions, right? Um, nothing, not even the best people have, and the people who do this for a living every day, run a network that's 100% available. So it's really important to make sure that you're in multiple places, um, or else you're kind of defeating the purpose. You know, you might as well not go down this route. Um, for our VOD, that's a little bit simpler. Um, same basic concept, except when you go and make the query, you, um, the thing I don't show is a call to our um, asset management service, returns back um, based on some heuristics from a third party vendor that we use. And then we choose which CDN we want, and then we go to um, one of our regions to pull that file. Um, this Diagram's a little bit dated. Um, when I put it together a couple of months ago, we were in a single um, region, but now we are in multiple ones for this so that we can go and have that redundancy. But at a very high level, that's sort of the architecture. Um, there's a lot sort of missing in between, um, but you get the point. Um, so what have we learned? Probably the most important thing. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are New York Mets fans here. Probably none. All right, so if you listen to the radio broadcast, you know, they do a sum up. What did we learn today, right? Um, so um, managing multiple vendors, it's not easy. Um, you know, there's certain uh, folks who will come in and pitch you about a ubiquitous solution and talk about the ease of management. That's not total BS. There is some work to this. Um, and so mul managing multiple vendors, understanding their different pricing models, making sure you uh, understand how that works and comparing apples to apples, it's not as simple as it looks. Um, you have the ultimate dilemma here. It's flexibility versus um, complexity. And every once in a while we find ourselves as we go down this journey thinking that we've built maybe too much of a rocket ship and we end up pulling back on certain things. Um, there's a lot of choices along the way and you've got to think about what one makes the most sense 
for the team that you have and for the support team that you have so that you can not only get it going but also be ready to troubleshoot it. Ideally, in a perfect world, you can automate most of this stuff and that's where you really want to end up. But there's a path and along the way, you're going to, as you go down this path, some of it will not be automated. You'll get there eventually, but that time in between, you've got to be prepared for the bumps. Um, now that you have multiple providers, the way this market works is usually there's a commit. Um, and you also want to make sure that you're delivering great quality of service, not for the sake of making commits. You need to make sure as you go down the path of negotiating that you're committing yourself to things that you can actually um, attain and not overcommit because you want to balance quality of service, at least for us, quality of service is the m number one um, thing that we care about. And managing the, the commits is number two. You don't want the, the, the other way around. So be careful as you enter into these agreements, especially if you get into, say, more than two. That means multiple ways of dealing with it. Um, as far as automation of this, there's some crude automation that's available at this point through several vendors, but it's not as robust as you'd like, especially as certain models are changing. Say you're in a bucket model versus you're in a, um, in a model where you have to, uh, where you hit a commit and then if you go over, there's a surcharge model. So these are things you're going to have to look at and in some ways plan out because there is a manual aspect to it. And if you, under, if you undershoot your commits too much, well, you've just lost every advantage you, did, you got in negotiating a great deal. So you got to uh, take a look at that. Um, pricing models keep changing. So every time a vendor comes in, there's, there's especially a new upstart vendor, hey, we got this great pricing model for you. Well, and they come up with these things you've never heard of, and that's great, but you don't, if you can't understand it, you can't manage it. Um, and so push back on those. A lot of times these guys will come in, um, push in their unique models, but you got to bring them back to more traditional models that you can manage or else, like I said before, if you undershoot a commit, you've really not, not saved a thing, right? Um, so still being learned, uh, hidden costs. Um, I'd like to, I call these, uh, one is midgress charges. So understand whether the provider you're dealing with charges midgress ones or not. Make sure you factor that into your total cost of what you're delivering. Some vendors do, some vendors don't, but you gotta make sure that you're understanding prices and comparing them equally. Um, there's nothing worse than finding out about those things after you've signed the deal. Um, Hotel California models. This is my uh, sort of jihad I have with the cloud providers right now, which is you can put your data in there, but when you try to get it out, you're gonna pay. All of them have transfer out classes right now, uh, transfer out costs. Understand what those are. If you go to an AWS, you go to a Google, you go to Microsoft, all of them have it. Make sure you understand what they are. Make sure you try to limit those exposures if you're gonna to go to this model. Um, it's something that I hope long-term they get more rational about, um, but at the moment, it's something you've gotta deal with. Um, try to manage your complexity. Again, unless you've got 100 folks sitting around with nothing to do, um, the more complex it is, the harder it is to manage. And if one of the goals is to get better redundancy and better reliability, if you make it so complex, um, you've lost that as well. Have instrumentation tools and metrics in place. The good news is if you're embarking on this journey now, the number of tools and the level of which they reach into your ecosystem is so much better than what it was three years ago. Um, there's several folks uh, that I saw on the program here today um, as either sponsors or attending, who offer really good solutions for that. Um, take advantage of those. You can't do this. It's like flying an airplane without any instruments, without having the proper instrumentation, proper monitoring, proper alerting in place. Things will go wrong. Ideally, you can route around it, but you need to know about it so that you can start to work with those vendors um, to get a better situation in place. Um, realize this is not a short journey. I remember when we started this three years, three and a half years ago at this point, um, I thought we would be done way sooner than we were. Um, it's taken me about double, it took us about double the time I thought it would, honestly. But realize it is a journey um, and not a quick sprint. Um, make sure you have good folks. Um, it's really important to have a good engineering team to pull this off. Um, you need them to understand not only 
software development and development of services, but they need to understand the video space, the different protocols, the different ecosystems, and keep up to date with emerging trends, because the way we started this and the way we ended it, um, the architectural roadmaps changed quite a bit along the way. Um, so I think those might be, whoa, what's left to do? Um, so, finish our conversion to HDLS from HDS, we're almost there, 95% um, of the way. Um, build out a better test automation suite, especially for our player. Um, this was a real problem for us early on, is when we pushed out new code, um, making sure it was reliable. Um, it goes without saying, the same basic principles you use to develop any other code should be applied here. Build out a good automated test suite. So we're about 60% of the way there now. Um, automated failover. We had a lot of manual failover in place. It was pretty quick, but we're probably now at 80% of automated failover across the whole ecosystem. And um, as I mentioned before, commitment management. That's probably the thing we're going to dig into next, which is how do we develop some code to automate how we are balancing our commitments, pulling from different CDN APIs um, so that we can feed that back into our routing, um, to our vendor's routing so solution. So those are the things that we have left to do. Um, and so with that, we'll see how well I did with time, but I think we can open it up to questions. All right, anybody have any? This could be like keeping everybody right on, deadly on time. Any questions? Oh, right in the back. So the question is, uh, what kind of metrics do we use for balancing upon different providers? Um, so it is a combination of quality of service as well as uh, cost metrics. Um, so quality of service is always going to be number one. If somebody's down, we're not going to send them traffic if they're having horrible performance in a certain region. Um, the algorithm that, we've, um, that we use that we, with our third-party provider that does this has been balanced between um, mostly towards the quality of service side. Although, you know, I'll be honest with you, if we've got a big old commitment sitting out there, we're going to maybe wait that. Um, unless, and we'll set a threshold, unless it's really bad, push some to that particular vendor. Um, so it's a balance. Um, ideally, like I said, the goal is to get your commitments low enough so that you're not so up against the wall um, that you can make quality of service your highest metric. Does that make sense? Other questions? Uh, during your slides, you kind of mentioned a little bit about the complexities of the station or ad flow. Um, can you talk about, you know, can you talk about that a little bit more and what you have to do to hold from that? So the question is um, complexity, especially when it relates to integrating with the ads, um, which is a never ending battle. So um, at a high level, you know, we're using mostly Google um, DFP for doing our ad serving. As the different VAST standards came out, um, those were challenges, especially when we were dealing through third parties for our player integration. Even dealing direct, um, there's a nice little finger pointing game that often comes um, between us and different vendors. So complexity level one is actually integrating properly with Google. Um, that's number one. It's not as clear cut as you think. Um, number two is vendors themselves who provide you creative and adherence to those standards. Um, they don't really do it that well, so sometimes you're going to have to work with your ad operations team on that. Um, and then theory is now with this whole notion of bidding and auctions and how you integrate in with those, um, that introduces another level, and quite frankly, another level of potential delay, uh, depending on how you do it. So that's, those are the things to look for. I know I'm not getting very specific, but you know, we could, I could give you war stories on any one of those three, or bore the heck out of the rest of the people here, whichever way you want to look at it. There. Do you have any automation, say, around um, ad failover? Automation around ad failover. Uh, right now, we are using mostly Google for that. So the direct answer is either we're going to serve a house ad or we're going to serve theirs. So that's the level of automation we have. So not a lot, to be honest with you. Okay. Other questions? All right, I think I'm between you and a break. Maybe I'll get out of the way. Thank you, guys.